Hi guys. Sorry I'm not here today, but I know you're in good hands with Lynn. Um, I know that Lynn has handed out the syllabus for you and gone over um, expectations, class format, um, and uh, things that are going to help you be successful in the lab. Um, we will, if you do have any particular questions, of course, please email me and um, I'll be um, obviously back to class uh, business as usual next week. Um, so again, if you have any questions, uh, write them down and bring them um, to class with you. Um, but please, again, read the um, syllabus thoroughly so that you can understand and um, be able to be successful in the class. As um, if you know me, I'm very diligent about um, abiding by the rules of the lab and uh, making everything safe and effective. So again, there's the syllabus, and I'll also post it on eCompanion. Um, so just in case if you do happen to lose it, I will have an extra copy there for you. I also have put in, or, or will put in eCompanion doc sharing a copy of your essential skills and also the reading list. Um, you may have chosen the new textbook, and that does not, the reading list does not reflect that new textbook. So again, just utilize the back index. Um, so for example, next week we were covering the gross examination of feces along with flotation. So I would just go to the index and review those reading lists. A few other things I wanted to discuss with you, and I know Lynn has done a great job, um, but this is a nice visual for you. Um, as you prepare for subsequent weeks, you can always refer back to this video. Um, I just wanted to talk about a few other things before we get into the specifics of uh, lab number one. Um, scientific names. I put an example right here um, of a common scientific name, Homo sapiens. Um, and that is um, the scientific name for the common human. Um, Homo is specifically referred to as the genus. And sapien, in this example, is specifically looking at or referring to the species. Today, when we discuss these common parasites that affect small animals, I'm gonna be referring to them by their common name and also their genus. And that's um, the term common, you certainly want to understand and identify, but also I'm going to test you not only on the common name, but also the genus. Even though today we might talk about the scientific name, I'm only testing you on the genus. You're welcome. He also wanted to review very briefly um, a nice uh, discussion on measurement of the metric system, using the metric system to measure things. And um, when we are specifically trying to measure distance, how the distance from here to here, we're going to use the unit meter, or we could use the um, measuring tool meter. Now the blessing with the metric system is that it's, it's very easy to use, and I know you don't believe me from VLP, um, but it, once you get used to it, it is very easy to convert um, these basic units of measurement. Let me explain further. Here, approximately, I'm talking very approximate, this is approximately one meter. If I was trying to figure out the distance from in between my two hands, I could use the measuring tool meter. Um, but if I needed to measure the distance from here to Mall of America, I wouldn't necessarily want to use meter, because this, again, this is a meter. That'd be a lot of meters from Egan to um, Mall of America. So to measure larger distances, I might choose the unit of measurement, the kilometer or kilometer. And to correlate the two, there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. 1,000. So you just added three zeros. But I'm talking parasites, things that for the most part we are going to identify under the microscope. So they're very, very, very small. So certainly kilometers, I'm not going to use kilometers, nor will I use meter. Still, I need to look at something under the microscope, 10 power, low power, very, very small. So let's choose a measuring tool um, in the metric system that would be more appropriate. Well, let's look at a smaller unit of measurement, millimeter. 
approximately a millimeter is between my two fingers. I, I should have a ruler here to show you to prove, but it's very, very small in between my two fingers. You can see it with your naked eye, but, and, but it's very small. Specifically, there are 1,000 millimeters in one meter. Do you see a trend here so far? So millimeters, you just uh, believe me or not, I can see that with my naked eye. And again, we are trying to discuss parasites that are going to be identified with the use of a microscope. So millimeters is certainly better measuring tool than kilometers and meters, but we can even do something even better, even more appropriate to these small little organisms. Here is where we're going to talk about the term micrometer. It's also known as the micrometer, just however you would like to say it. And simply put, it's also known as the micron. Now, a micrometer or a micron, you take this little one millimeter and divide it into 1,000 equal parts. Ooh, very, very, very small. You can only see those tiny little microns with the use of a microscope. And to give you some analogy, there are 1,000 microns in one millimeter. And the reason I bring this up is because in a few moments we're going to start talking about the common parasites in lab number one. And I'm going to discuss each one using different characteristics. Um, size is going to be one characteristic that I, I use to help differentiate one parasite from the next. And for example, Homo sapien is talking about all of the humans. Well, I look different than you. I might be a different height. I might be a different weight. I might have different color hair. I might have different color skin. So those are, care even though we're all the same, scientifically speaking, we have characteristics that are gonna help differentiate one person from the next. And I'm gonna help you do that um, with these common parasites in lab number one. So I am not an artist by any means, but I have drawn here a field of view on 10 power. So we're just going to imagine that we're visually looking under the microscope using a low power or 10 power. Here is where I'm going to grab the form that I would like you to use if you haven't already done so. The lab module, lab parasite lab number one. I believe it's on page 15 and page 16. And here we're going to go through these common parasites. I've also put um, a PowerPoint on eCompanion in the doc sharing that shows you um, visually examples of each of these parasites, but I'm going to draw them. Um, so please use your PowerPoint as a resource, please use this as a resource, use your reading list as a resource. Um, on page 15 and 16, we're going to cover nine different parasites. Um, again, I know Lynn made a comment of emphasizing to you that on page 5, I believe it is, there is an inventory of small animal parasites. They're broken down into internal and then externals, which we'll get to halfway through the semester. These are the only parasites you will be tested on in the final. So our first proficiency that's only covering internal parasites, we only have to worry about and be able to identify nine of them. So that's not too bad. Don't get too intimidated by it. So, the first one that I would like to discuss is number one. And it says here, Toxicara canis, comma, Toxicara cata. So using the scientific name, Toxicara is the genus. Toxicara canis, canis is an example of the species. Again, you can assume Toxicara canis looks very similar to Toxicara cata. Um, and that is true. You can assume one comes from a dog, canis, and one comes from a cat, cat eye. But here is what they look like microscopically. On 10 power, this egg is going to appear round to oval. Again, some people are tall, some people are short, some people are skinny, some people are bigger, more voluptuous. So round to oval, and it's got a very thick outer membrane. I always call this membrane roughly. And if you don't believe me, when we do see it in real life, I want you to bump up your objective to 40 power and get a closer look at it. And it tends to be very roughly, squiggly. But that thick outer membrane, think of it like a thick winter coat. 
and it's protecting you from the elements. And so in this case, the organism is inside of here. And for Toxicara, it's going to be a very dark brown filled in center, completely filled in dark brown. On average, a Toxicara egg is around 70 microns. To put it into perspective, last semester or whenever you took VLP, when you did microscopic examination of urine, you looked on 10 power for casts, those um, structures, those cellular structures made of protein. And you might recall seeing um, a hyalin cast, and they tended to be on the edge of the cover slip. And on average, goes, gosh, those things can be quite large, like 200 microns. So you could see it with your name, you could see it easily under the microscope. And you can easily see Toxicara um, under the microscope using 10 power magnification. If you don't find it, it tells me that you're not scanning your slide or your test subject well enough. And then I'll beat you. No, I'm just kidding. So there are some common characteristics for the classic Toxicara egg. Toxicara, either Toxicara canis or Toxicara cati, they share the common name roundworm. Now I'm gonna just um, give you a little bit more because sometimes not all these eggs look like that. Not all these eggs, parasites, read the textbooks. So let me give you a little sex talk. Mom and dad, there needs to be a male worm, there needs to be a female worm and they need to copulate. These worms, on the PowerPoint, you'll see a picture of an adult worm, and they look like a piece of spaghetti. Toxicara canis tends to be, as an adult, a little bit bigger than Toxicara cati, but nonetheless, they both look like pieces of spaghetti. Mom and dad need to copulate, they need to mate, and this is going to be their offspring. This is referred to as an egg. The egg is going to mature, and it actually is going to be defecated out of that dog or that cat. So again, mom and dad have these worms in their system. Specifically, they live in the intestines. They mate, produce these eggs. These eggs are defecated out. Before they're defecated out, they might look like what I'm gonna call a mature egg. And again, here you have the same round to oval outer membrane same squiggly, roughly membrane, but instead of that dark brown filled in center, you have a microscopic worm. And a microscopic worm is called a larva. So this is what we would call a larvated egg. And you're gonna see these commonly as well. Um, this is what's going to be defecated out of the animal and eventually that larva is going to escape the egg. But that's more, more to come in lecture, to talk fully about their life cycle. Again, I know that Lynn emphasized our focus is going to be on identifying these parasites properly. And we're also going to talk about the tests involved, uh, very specifically to help identify these parasites. And then we're also going to go a little bit more into uh, common dewormers. And we're going to practice dosage calculations as well. So this is the common roundworm, which is, um, belongs to the genus Toxicara. Number two is called Toxascaris. That's the genus. The common name of Toxascaris is roundworm. If you've taken medical terminology, an ascarid is a roundworm. So this genus tells you kind of what organism you're dealing with. Toxascaris looks very similar to Toxicara, but there is some, there is a difference. So, these guys tend to be more oval than round, but again, they can be round, no big deal. They have the same membrane as Toxicar, so that squiggly membrane. But instead of that dark, 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 dark brown filled in center, that milk chocolate brown, it's lighter brown, and it's kind of mottled looking. So it's not filled in it's like that. But again, same size approximately. Don't freak out as if you go into the textbooks and you say, well, Toxascaris is 68 microns. It's so close. Again, 
I'm this height, you might be this height, you might be this height, We're, but we all belong to the same genus. So, so far we've got helpful indicators of size, color, and other characteristics like this membrane. Again, the common name of Toxascaris is roundworm, and guess what the adults look like? They look like pieces of spaghetti, because all roundworms look the same um, as an adult. Number three is Trichurus, Trichurus. I don't care how you say it, as long as you properly identify it. Trichurus is probably the most um, easily, I, people, students love this one because it's pretty easy to identify. And what it looks like, again, I'm not an artist, is it looks like a football or a lemon. It's that oblong shape like a football or a lemon. And it actually has a pretty thick membrane, and it's got this filled in center. And I like the analogy of a lemon because it's yellow in color, just like a lemon. So it's football shaped, and you can see that, um, you can't see that it's yellow, but it's yellow like a lemon. And it's got these two plugs, or these two doors, at the ends of each side of this egg. And that's really important because these plugs, anatomically called operculum, are symmetric, which means they're exactly opposite. And they're, they are bipolar, which means they are, there are two of them. There you go. Now, I tried to draw it a little bit smaller than our common roundworms. So on average, this one might be 65 microns. No problem, just a little bit smaller easily identifiable on 10 power when you're scanning next week when you start scanning your tests. Um, this is a fun one. Now as an adult, um, this one is very similar to the roundworm adults in that it is round in diameter like a piece of spaghetti. Not a piece of fettuccine, a piece of spaghetti. But this Trichurus egg is commonly called, this parasite is, has a common name of whip work. And a whip, if you think about whipping your horse or using a whip for whatever purpose, um, it tapers. And so the head of this worm is cylindrical, round in diameter like a piece of spaghetti, but as you go towards the other end, the butt end, the anus end, it tapers to be like a piece of angel hair pasta. So it tapers from head to toe. Number four, there are two, pair, two genuses here. One is Ancylostoma, Ancylostoma. The other one is Uncinarium. Both of those genuses share the common name hookworm. A hookworm egg tends to be oval and a thin membrane with little circles inside. On average, they run around 65 microns, on average, approximately. Uncinaria tends to be a little bit bigger, but no big deal um, than Ancylostoma, but again, no big deal. This is a hookworm egg, and as an adult, hookworms are related to these roundworms and whipworms in that they are round in diameter. These adults tend to be shorter pieces of spaghetti and fatter pieces of spaghetti. So I use the analogy of overcooking pasta, uh, where it gets too bloated. That's what a hookworm adult looks like. And so far, all of these cylindrical type worms, it's very uncommon for us to see them as adults. But instead, we rely on finding their babies, their eggs. Now, Let's go back to this egg right up here. We call that a larvated roundworm egg. You can also see a larvated whipworm egg. So again, it might look like, but instead of all this stuff in the center, you see a microscopic a worm. A microscopic worm, again, would be called a larva. This would be the larvated egg. Um, I should have drawn it a little bit smaller, but again, remember I'm not artistic. Here is a hookworm, but instead of these little morula of cells, you have the free-floating larva. So again, uh, you might see them larvated, you might not see them larvated, but I thought I would um, give you a heads up. Now, 
So far, all of these guys are related to each other in that they're all nematodes. These are all terms we'll cover week one and week two in lecture. And a nematode or a nematode is a cylindrical worm, so some sort of piece of spaghetti. But now as we progress to number five and number six, we move away from the cylindrical pieces of spaghetti and instead go to flat worms that are segmented. And these are known as our tapeworms. And so take a piece of fettuccine and break it up into tiny little pieces. That's what a tapeworm is. Flat worms that are segmented. Now the first one here, diplidium. The common name of diplidium is simply a tapeworm or you can also, uh, when you do your readings, it is also called the flea tapeworm. But as an adult, this is what a flea tapeworm egg looks like. Mm. It's a little too big. So with flea tapeworm egg, diplidium, this is an egg, this is an egg, this is an egg, this is an egg. All these circles inside are actual eggs and you tend to see a packet of eggs. Each of these eggs is around 30 microns and usually again you see eggs in packets. So this can be 200, 250 microns. Quite large. Now, can you see how size is so valuable? Because I drew this egg right here and I said it had a thin membrane and little circles inside. Doesn't this one have a thin membrane and little circles inside? Yes, but size considerably different. So as we get into our fecal examination next week and utilize that microscope, um, you're going to be able to see these eggs um, and see their drastic differences between them. As an adult, again, you usually see um, this worm, when it is expelled out of the body, when the animal does defecate it out, the anus is gonna break this long segmented worm into its little bits. And so each of the tapeworm segments, a segment is called a proglottid, each of these segments can look like a piece of rice. Number six, tania. This is probably the one egg that um, students have the most trouble with. And I'm hoping that these characteristics are gonna help you um, in that you don't um, struggle with this egg. Tania. Tania is an egg that is about 35 microns long. It has a thick membrane, but it has a striated membrane. So it looks like bicycle spokes versus the roughly squiggly membrane of roundworm membranes. If you don't believe me, next week and the subsequent weeks when we work with these parasitic eggs, bump it up to 40 power, high power, and you'll be able to better appreciate these striations in the outer membrane. This center is filled in, and a lot of your resources will say to look for hooks inside um, this. Don't necessarily rely on finding these hooks, because sometimes you can't see them more so focus on the striated membrane and the overall size. Many students confuse Tania, this um, parasite has the common name of tapeworm or hunting tapeworm. Um, many students confuse it with a roundworm egg and first of all, you shouldn't confuse it because this one is at least half the size. And secondly, the membranes are quite different. So I hope that we don't struggle with them if we understand these common characteristics. So this is Tania, known as tapeworm or the hunting tapeworm. So these two are related. They're both tapeworms, but a big difference between them. Um, visually, they're babies. Number seven, we go into a different family of parasites. Uh, Paragonimus. Paragonimus is the genus of the common lung fluke, lung like your lungs. A fluke is known as a trematode. A trematode, uh, trematodes are flat worms, but they're not segmented. So these, as adults, 
look like, I, uh, I like the analogy of a blood sucker or a little leech uh, with some shape to them. Again, in the PowerPoint that I have on eCompanion Doc Sharing, it shows you some um, common um, egg pictures of, of these guys. The lung fluke, as an egg, looks like this. It is approximately 75 microns, and it usually is seen in, in an oval shape. But it can be really weird shapes as well. But usually, for the most part, they're somewhat oval. They have one operculum, or one plug. Remember up here with Trichurus or Trichurus? It had two plugs that were opposite each other, and again, bipolar, meaning two. Here we only have one. It has a membrane and it's got this filled in, mottled looking center. Another characteristic of all flukes, so including this one, is that they're a beautiful gold color. Gold, gold, gold. I'm trying to find gold in this room, but gold, not, not white gold, yellow gold. Gorgeous color versus, remember this was more lemon color, that light yellow. So color can be very helpful in identifying one parasite from the next. That is the common lung fluke. I'll give you a little, um, yes, you could see a lung fluke that was larvated too. Again, I hope you see a trend with all of them. But usually, again, you like to, you see them like this. Um, we are going to rely on the fecal exam, more specifically the fecal flotation, which we're gonna start next week, um, to find these parasites. Well, all of these guys are found in the gastrointestinal system, but I just said this one was found in the lungs. Why are we looking in the feces, the poop, to diagnose this egg? Well, think about these adults infiltrating the lung tissue. And if you have anything abnormal in the lung tissue, it's gonna cause you to cough. <coughs> so an animal is going to do that <coughs> and bring up some phlegm and in that phlegm, we could have some of these eggs. And they're not going to grab a Kleenex and wipe away their phlegm or cough it out. They're going to swallow it. Hence bringing it into the gastrointestinal system. Hence having us find it in the feces. Kind of cool. Our last two um, are going to belong to a different family of parasites. So when I say family, the roundworm, the roundworm, the roundworm, the whipworm, the hookworm, they were all cylindrical worms. They all uh, belonged to the same family. They had common characteristics. We have here the two tapeworms. They are kissing cousins. And here we only have one fluke that infects um, small animals. And again, our focus is gonna be small animals, cats and dogs. Later on, we'll do large animal and some exotics. This last family of parasites are referred to as protozoans. And protozoans are single-celled organisms. They only have one cell. All of these other parasites, when I mentioned mom and dad, these are complex animals. They're capable of having sex. If you are one cell, you can't have sexual reproduction. So they're far more simple, simple organisms. But it doesn't mean that they can't cause harm. And these last two can be very dangerous. The first one, number eight, is known as isospora or isospora. And isospora's common name is coccidia. And again, there's many visuals in the doc sharing e-companion. We're gonna cover these throughout our weeks and also in lecture. Now, because we're a sim simple cell, simple organism, we, we are not we don't, we're not complex. So we can't use the term like adult or egg. And so hence you see the word oocyst. And here is what the stage of, um, this is what this parasite is gonna look like. And it's going to have a stage in which we call it an oocyst. I'm gonna put it over here. So on average, it's about 35 microns, very similar to this egg to the left, tania. But it doesn't have that thick striated membrane. It doesn't have a thick membrane at all and it's got this circle on the inside. Now, it can, and this is what a common oocyst will look like.
But if you are a simple organism made of one cell, how do you reproduce? You reproduce asexually. And the reason I bring this up is because you can also see this coccidia oocyst going through reproduction. This is called binary fission or asexual reproduction. And ultimately, these two, this is the nucleus, the brain of the cell, it's going to break apart and then ultimately it's going to divide into two identical daughter cells. So when you see it with two circles inside, it's reproducing. But it's still an oocyst and it's still coccidia. It's pretty cool. Very, very, very common. For in veterinary medicine, uh, small animals, you're going to see tons of roundworms and hookworms, and you're going to see tons of coccidia. The final one is known as giardia. The common name for giardia is giardia. Hey, I can deal with that one. You can see two terms, a cyst and a trophozoite. Now the problem with this is, is I can't draw it on this field of view on 10 power. This organism is very, very small, and you are unable to really appreciate it on 10 power. Um, we need to rely on 40 power or high power to diagnose this parasite. So let's pretend this is 40 power here, just over here, just for fun. So we're going to see Giardia in two different forms. Even though it's a single-celled organism made of one cell, as it goes through um, its maturation, binary fission, its asexual reproduction, it can look somewhat different. And on 40 power, the cyst isn't going to look like much. It's going to look like a round to oval thing. There is a nucleus inside, but it's really hard to see. And many times if you need to uh, diagnose a cyst, you might use a stain. And so on the Doc Sharing eCompanion PowerPoint, um, you're going to see the cysts um, in pictures that are either stained with new methylene blue, which make them appear more purple, or iodine, make them appear more orange. And on average, this is about 10 microns. So like one seventh the size of this on 40 power. Again, not going to be, you're not going to be able to see it on 10. This is what we would call a cyst. Um, in the cyst stage, Giardia is dormant, um, which means um, it's not infective. So if I ate a Giardia cyst right now, it probably is unlikely going to cause me disease. Anyways, the other stage that you can see this is what's known as a trophozoite. Now some people say it looks like the trophozoite has two eyes. Again, it's not a complex animal, it's just the nucleus giving the appearance of eyes. And it has these little hair-like projections on one end, and that's going to allow it to move, to swim. And this is again known as the trophozoite. But again, the size is similar, it's about 10, 11 microns. So very, very small. And when you do see this in your fecal exams, in your tests that we're going to do, the trophozoites are a little easier to identify because they're moving. And again, they have some characteristics that make them look like they're looking at you or smiling at you. But that again is Giardia. So here at least you got to see a visual representation of the nine common parasites that we're going to, you're going to identify properly. Um, throughout the course of our semester. It's imperative, it's critical that we properly identify them because if we don't, then the animal's not going to be put on the proper medicine to kill the parasite. And as you will learn in lecture, parasites offer no benefit. Um, they bring nothing to the table. If anything, they're gonna cause the animal harm. And so hence, we would need to kill them with some common uh, parasiticides, things that kill parasites, like dewormers and such. So, hence that's why we're going to discuss dewormers and uh, par things that kill parasites in our class as well. We're going to do so in lecture. So you've taken the information provided to you today and you've made comments about these classic characteristics, size, um, characteristics like color, membranes, other features that help distinguish one from the next. And you are, have a homework assignment and what you're going to do is you are going to fill in this chart. And if you're anything like me, um, I'm not a very good artist. And so for the illustrations, I might go onto the internet 
or uh, photocopy pages from my textbooks, whatever the case may be, and put proper visualizations of these eggs in this chart. And then again, you can fill in the other components, size and other characteristics that are going to help you properly identify this. This is going to be due at the beginning of class next week. Let me give you a wink wink heads up. When we are doing our very first proficiency, our complete fecal proficiency, that's going to be the examination where I give you a fecal sample and you perform the test and if there are any parasites in it, you are able to properly identify that parasite. Uh, with that proficiency, the fecal proficiency, you are able to use this chart and this chart only. And if you don't accomplish this chart, you're not going to get the points next week, nor are you going to be able to use it. I believe it's module seven when we have that proficiency. So this homework assignment is something that is really important um, because it's taking all that information we covered today and putting it on one sheet of paper that again you can use in your subsequent weeks in lab with us, use it on the proficiency, you can take it with you into future classes like comp review and for your certification. So it's a really nice tool. So again, um, please review your syllabus. Um, I know that Lynn had mentioned that next week we're going to start working with fecal feces and if you choose you can bring in feces from an animal at your home, either cat and dog. Other species will do towards the end of the semester, but we're going to focus on cat and dog for the first few weeks and if you'd like to bring in a stool sample, please do so. Put it in a leak-free, odor-free container, label it and you can put it in the um, sample, um, the non-food fridge in animal care um, and I'll bring them into lab the next time I see you. All right. All right. Um, email me if you have any questions before that because I'll be back in town on Monday. Thanks very much.